Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett and today's episode is called the Top 20 UFO Cases in Nevada. I've dug really deep into the history of encounters in Nevada and come up with a list of what I think are the top 20 best UFO cases. I used various metrics to decide you know, what is the best case. These are cases that are influential, uh, got a lot of publicity, were perhaps widely viewed or have lots of evidence or are unique in some way. So these are the cases coming out of Nevada that have really shaped our understanding of the UFO phenomena. I think a different researcher may have come up with a completely different list, but this is mine and I'm really excited about sharing it with you because uh, some of these cases I think you'll have heard of, but I've got new information on them, I hope. And I think some of these cases you have not heard of for sure. And they should be much more widely known than they are. So I'm going to start with case number 20 and move all the way to, to the very best case, number one. So let's start with case 20. Case 20 is Blue Book case number 721, which was unidentified. Uh, it's the first case investigated by Project Blue Book and declared unidentified in the state of Nevada, and it occurred on May 7th, 1950, to an elderly couple and their grandson who were returning home from a picnic to their home in Ely, Nevada. They were about eight miles south of town, and they saw this silver-white object hovering at treetop level. And it's amazing because this object stayed in place for about 10 minutes, then started to oscillate a little bit, and then suddenly accelerated upwards very quickly and zoomed out of sight. They reported their case officially, and Blue Book officers arrived to interview them and were unable to come up with an explanation and actually declared the case unidentified. This is significant because it's only one of four cases that Blue Book declared unidentified in Nevada and really the only involving civilian witnesses. Now, case number 19 is the UFO caught in a spotlight. This is a very rare type of UFO case. There are only a few that I know of. There's one that occurred in California, outside of in Los Angeles in 1942. It's often called the Battle of Los Angeles. Another very famous UFO searchlight case occurred in Norwood, Ohio in 1949 and again involved this UFO that was caught in a spotlight. Well, this exact thing happened in Nevada. It's a fairly recent case. It occurred on December 1st, 2000 and appeared in the Las Vegas Review Journal a couple of weeks later. Uh, it occurred at the premiere opening of the Thomas N. Mack Rodeo. And I'd just like to read you the first-hand account. And I'm quoting now. Some folks are still buzzing about what some consider a UFO sighting high above the Thomas and Mack on December 1st, the opening night of the National Finals Rodeo. Dozens watched as a large on-property searchlight, the largest in the world at 50,000 watts, locked onto the cylindrical object, which didn't move for 45 minutes. So they actually called uh, Nellis Air Force Base and spoke with Tech Sergeant Charles Ramey, uh, who was the Air Force Base Public Affairs Officer, and he said that they had no information about it and had not received any calls. But it's a significant case because not only its unique elements in terms of its searchlight connection, but it was widely viewed and for a long period of time over a pretty crowded area and a public event. Not a lot of cases like that, so it's a, definitely an interesting case. Case number 18 is a really interesting multiple witness case. Uh, this had military officers and uh, all trained observers, so this is a very significant case because uh, each of these guys were in independent locations. This account appeared in the LA Times shortly after it occurred, and what happened was on June 24th, 1950, Captain E. L. Remlin and Captain Sam B. Wiper were flying a UAL mainliner transport at about 4,000 feet over Las Vegas when they saw this glowing object 
It had a bright blue center and a bright orange corona around it and was flying in a horizontal trajectory about 6,000 feet above them, so at about 20,000 feet. And it was pretty far away from maybe about 20 miles, they estimated. And I uh, was flying at a very high speed. Uh, what they did not know is that there were other witnesses. There was also an Air Force pilot who saw this. There was also a Navy pilot who was flying in the area. He observed it as well. And finally, there were further Army witnesses on the ground who reported seeing the same sighting. And now we move to Case 17, a fleet of UFOs at Nellis Air Force Base. This occurred on April 17, 1952, about five minutes after noon. And there were numerous witnesses, uh, Technical Sergeant Orville Lawson, Sheet Metal Foreman Rudy Tonser, Sheet Metal Shop Workers, R.K. Van Houten, Edward Gregory, and Charles Rullifson all saw a group of about 18 objects darting across the sky. They were in a sort of random formation, but all moved in a straight line, all except one of them, which was ahead of the main group and was zigzagging back and forth. So uh, the first person to actually see this was R.K. Van Houten. He alerted the others, and uh, they observed these objects for about 30 seconds, a whole fleet of them, and estimate that they were pretty high up there, about 40,000 feet, and uh, there were no contrails or anything seen, totally silent, and a, a really interesting sighting because it involved not only objects moving directly over a military base and were widely viewed by trained observers, but there were an awful lot of them, uh, 18 disc-like objects. So a real, you know, sizable fleet of UFOs. And now we move to case number 16. Case number 16 is a top secret case uh, which became revealed through the Freedom of Information Act and uh, was finally disclosed 38 years after it happened. This occurred on June 28, 1947 at 3.15 p.m., this is actually only a few days after the really famous Kenneth Arnold sighting over Mount Rainier, Washington. The main witness in this case was First Lieutenant Eric B. Armstrong, and he was flying his F-51 fighter about 30 miles north of Lake Mead at an altitude of 10,000 feet. And looking down, he saw a group of about five or six small white round disks, all clustered together in a close formation about 4,000 feet below him. He said they moved pretty smoothly in a gentle path and at about 285 miles per hour, which was matching his airspeed. And they paced his uh, jet for a little while, his F-51 fighter, and then suddenly darted off at an angle and disappeared over the distance, off into the distance. Well, only months earlier, there had been another report in the area, so Armstrong's sighting got a, caused a lot of attention, actually, and it caused real big waves at high levels and later became one of about 20 cases that were included in a top-secret air intelligence report. It's report number 100-203-79, the title of the report is called The Analysis of Flying Object Incidents in the U.S. And uh, yeah, this remained secret for decades. This report was signed by both the USAF Director of Intelligence and the Office of Naval Intelligence and remained top secret for 38 years until declassified by the efforts of UFO researcher Robert Todd who was able to obtain a copy using the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, so yeah, definitely a significant case. Case number 15 is Blue Book case number 1986, which was also declared unidentified. And this case occurred on August 26, 1952 at 12.10 a.m., 
uh, right over Lathrop Wells in Nevada, of course. The main witness is uh, Air Force Captain D.A. Woods, and it's probably his uh, credibility which really uh, made this case ending up to be un declared unidentified. Uh, the fact that he was an Air Force pilot. And what he saw was one large, very bright object with sort of a V-shaped contrail leading off of it. And it flew very quickly, then stopped, hovered, made a 90-degree turn, and followed by a gentle climb, and accel accelerated off very quickly into the distance. Now we move to case number 14, Aliens in Casinos. And believe me, I know how this sounds, but this is apparently a thing. Uh, ETs are seen in public places. I've seen this in many other states, but it was particularly prevalent in Nevada. And there were a smattering of cases in which people reported seeing ETs in casinos. Now, the first case really surprised me, but as I started encountering more of them, I thought, wow, you know, this is a really interesting and unique aspect to Nevada's UFO encounters. So I'd like to cover a couple of these. One of my favorite cases occurred in the mid-1980s. I don't have the exact date. It comes from a great researcher who I've met many times. Her name is Misha Johnston, and uh, she's a Las Vegas-based UFO researcher and experiencer. And uh, she was approached by a gentleman who had an incredible story. It turned out he was uh, worked in a casino. He didn't name the actual casino, but it's his job to monitor the secret cameras uh, situated throughout the casino uh, to make sure that people weren't cheating or stealing and so on. And uh, there was this incident that occurred where these very strange figures were seen at a casino table. And everyone who was monitoring this on the cameras, they clustered around the cameras and were watching this because these did not look like normal people. Uh, there were two strange looking people. One was about five feet tall, uh, slightly larger perhaps than normal bald heads, dark eyes, small nose and mouth. They appeared to be wearing weird clothes, white tunics or robes, and kind of were observing this game as it took place. And no one seemed to notice them. That was another weird thing. Uh, so what really kind of tipped off the casino security personnel was that these cameras that were observing them are all hidden behind mirrors and are not visible from the casino itself. They're hidden cameras. Uh, despite that, one of these figures at some point looked straight up into the camera, uh, the hidden camera. So there is apparently a video which exists of this. However, what's interesting is the security personnel who saw this was able to uh, get out some uh, footage from this, got two still pictures taken from this uh, alleged video. Uh, so it's a very interesting case and one of several in which people have seen ETs in casinos. Uh, another case involving an ET in casino occurred at the Circus Circus Casino. It's a great case. We've got the name of the witness and everything. It's photographs, the whole deal. This occurred in July 1990 to London native Brian Hampton. He's a 47-year-old professor of history who was decided to visit Las Vegas in July of 1990. Uh, and he, he went to uh, Las Vegas and was, had booked a hotel at Circus Circus and was actually outside of the hotel on walking the strip and looking at the neon lights. And as he's walking along a busy street just off the strip next to a casino, he saw two people, two ladies looking up at the sky. And so he looked up to see what they were observing. And as he says, there were in the sky two round disks, two UFOs. They bloody well just hung there. A few other people stopped and looked, but nobody got excited. I thought, these bloody Yanks must have seen this before. 
So he was really surprised and a bit confused that this wasn't causing more excitement. These objects were round, gray in color, with a dark band around the edge and a, sort of a dark circle in the center. They hovered closely together, almost directly overhead. And uh, he had his camera in his hand. Brian Hampton did. So he took, quickly snapped a photo. At this point, the objects began to turn white and he snapped a second photo just as both objects disappeared. So he was actually able to capture these things on camera. And here's where things go from strange to much stranger. I mean, this is bizarre. He, after uh, taking this picture, he decided he, he would go to bed for the evening. And uh, it was this, that evening, he went to his hotel room in Circus Circus and was undressing in his hotel room and getting ready to go to bed when he heard someone uh, in the bathroom. He fir first thought it was children running down the hallway outside, actually, but realized it was coming from his bathroom. And uh, the bathroom door was closed. So he said, who's ever in there? Come out now. And uh, there was no answer. So he slowly opened the door and uh, the, whoever was in the bathroom slammed the door closed. And I'll just quote Brian Hampton here directly. As Brian Hampton says, I angrily pushed on the door and they pushed back. With the door partly open once again, I slid my arm along the inside bathroom wall to turn on the light switch, which I did, but immediately they turned the light back off and powerfully slammed the door. Now I was bloody well angry. I got down on the floor and braced my back against the closet wall my feet against the bath door, and I kicked it open. This was a bad idea. Uh, at this point, he still thought he was dealing with children, and he could barely believe what happened next. As he says, when the door opened, at least six dark gray shielded things came jumping through the open door. I know it sounds bloody crazy, and I've never told anybody, but I know what I saw. Uh, Brian said that what he saw were actually s small gray-skinned figures with large heads wearing uniforms. Uh, he says they looked very much like the ETs described by Ed Walters in the Gulf Breeze UFO case. And as Brian Hampton says, and I'm quoting again, they jumped on over and around me. The last thing I remember was a nasty, musty smell. That's it. It all happened so fast, I hardly knew what happened. I was blinded by a light, and I must have blacked out. When I woke up the next morning, I was lying on the floor next to the bathroom door. So uh, that is a very stra strange experience. And what's amazing about it is he has the photographs to back it up. Uh, so I'm not sure what to make of it other than this is apparently a thing. ETs are visiting casinos. Uh, there was another case which actually comes from the National UFO Reporting Center, reported anonymously. This occurred in 1990. A gentleman, by I'll, I'll call him David, uh, he was traveling from New Mexico to his home in California and driving through Las Vegas, he decided to stop for and do some gambling at a casino. So he went to the Tropicana Casino and... Uh, was playing blackjack long into the night, and this is when he had a very strange experience. <laughs> and I'll just quote him directly because it's an amazing account. As the witness says, I went to the restroom around 4 a.m., and on my way back to the tables, I stopped and watched a peculiar individual walking up the stairs. This person had a hat and sunglasses on, yet something wasn't right with the way he was walking or climbing the stairs. It looked, like, it looked like he was stuck in mud. His knees sort of came out to the side as he tried raising his feet to take the next step. I noticed also that there were about three more that looked just like him at the top of the stairs, yet a bit taller. They were all skinny, tall, and I recall noticing their whitish-like hair that seemed to shimmer as if light was bouncing off it. I had never seen hair like this before. My reaction was, what a freak. Well, as soon as the witness thought that, the figure climbing the stairs slowly turned around and locked gazes with him. 
and the witness had the distinct impression that he had heard what he was thinking, as if reading his thoughts. Yeah, so he quickly returned to the table and didn't know what to make of it. It wasn't until years later that he read a similar account, which actually comes from yet another witness. Uh, this next case comes from Charles Hall, who actually made quite a splash when he wrote about his encounters in a series of books. Uh, he had encounters at Nellis Air Force Base while he was stationed there as a weather officer and said that he met tall white ETs uh, who he also saw at casinos. Uh, he visited casinos with them and they would wear wigs and sunglasses and hats and a disguise to sort of disguise their appearance. Uh, but were looked enough like us uh, that they could actually visit casinos firsthand. <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, these are the types of cases we're getting. I'm not sure what to make of them, but there's enough of them that I think they deserve a second look. So now we're going to move to case number 13, a physical evidence UFO case. This occurred on February 28th, 1980, uh, involved two anonymous gentlemen who were traveling through Nevada on their way to Idaho. Uh, they had a pickup truck which was filled with all their belongings, which they held in place by tying a parachute over the flatbed. And uh, they'd dr been driving for many hours. They pulled over and got gas and always checked to make sure that the parachute was still in place, which it was. And around 10 p.m. on February 28th, they stopped along the road at a section near Curry, Nevada. This is just a tiny little town with a population of about 20 people. So a very remote area. And it was a cold night, so they stayed inside of the cab of the truck while they started heating up some coffee on a hot plate. And as condensation began to obscure the windows, that's when one of them noticed shadows moving overhead. So they cleared the windows and jumped out of the truck and looked up, and they saw this black shape. It was about the size of a house, they said, hovering only a hundred feet over their truck. It was sort of oval in shape, kind of like a potato, they said. And uh, yeah, very low. So they decided that they're going to <laughs> take off and get away from this thing. And uh, were about to leave when they saw that their parachute on their flatbed had been, quote, torn to shreds. The ropes and the nylon straps had been either melted or broken. So they secured it as best as they could with a stapler and uh, what resources they had and uh, jumped back into their pickup truck and started the engine to take off and they raced away. And as they moved off, this object followed them over their car and their vehicle itself started to uh, fail. The engine coughed and sputtered, and the speedometer and the fuel gauge started malfunctioning, and they could see that this object was still very low overhead. They coasted downhill as far as they could. They tried, they tried to switch to a second fuel tank that they had, but that also malfunctioned. And uh, a few mo moments later, their engine suddenly roared back to life, and looking up, they could see that this object was now gone. Uh, they reported their case to MUFON. The case was investigated officially by MUFON field investigator Cindy Costello. And after she interviewed the witnesses, she became absolutely convinced of their authenticity. So yeah, pretty exciting case, uh, which got a good deal of attention actually. Another case that got even more attention is case number 12. And this case is very interesting and somewhat unique. And it involves a UFO that blocked the road, not allowing two witnesses to pass. It occurred on June 25th, 1964. The two witnesses were George W. Rogers and his brother, Burt Rogers. They were driving from their home in Spring Valley to the town of Ely, Nevada. And at some point between the two towns, they noticed a strange looking object ahead of them. It was hovering about four feet high alongside the road. And uh, they thought maybe it was a car that had fallen off the road. 
And as they drove alongside it, this thing suddenly rose up, darted ahead, and landed directly in front of them in the center of the road. Uh, it was a, had a very strange shape. It was sort of a bulged, curved, pyramid-shaped top that tapered down to a two-foot-long slender pedestal. So not your average looking UFO. Uh, they thought that the pedestal looked like it was landing gear. Um, investigators later wondered if it could have been a very strong, opaque beam of light. But the brothers thought it was composed of shiny metal or plastic. And the entire object was spinning rapidly, but staying in the same exact location. They did notice a strange red insignia on the side of it, but were unable to read it because the object was spinning too fast. So one of the witnesses, George, jumped out of the car and ran up to actually touch this thing. However, as soon as he got close, it made a loud humming noise and zoomed 10 feet up into the air and landed back down 40 feet ahead on the highway. So he ran ahead again and approached it, with, and the same exact thing happened. He did this another three times, and each time this object suddenly increased in noise and hopped ahead further on the highway. As George says, and I'm quoting here, it occurred to me that I was fooling around with something that I didn't know anything about. Bert was yelling for me to get away from that thing. I decided that was a pretty good advice, so I went back and got into the car. At this point, the object rose slowly and moved east over a ridge and off into the distance. Uh, they told newspaper reporters, and uh, this was reported in the e Ely Record on July 1st of that year, and researcher Frank Edwards also wrote about this case, uh, which, yeah, eventually became fairly well known, and it's a very interesting case. And now we move to case number 11. This is a car lift case. These are a very rare type of case in which UFOs lift cars off the highway. Uh, Nevada has, I think, three cases like this at least, and this is one of them. It occurred on February 14, 1974. The witnesses were brothers, both businessmen. They were driving a rented U-Haul truck from Idaho to California, and we're heading through Nevada on Highway 93, about 55 miles north of Eli. They were driving through the night, so it was about 4.15 a.m. when one of the brothers, who I'll call Chuck, he was driving, he saw four luminous blue-green objects kind of flying in a row at a very low elevation to the right of the highway. He turned to his brother and, and who was asleep and said, wake up, you know, I think we're being followed by a UFO. And his brother, who I'll, I'll just call Dave, uh, he was asleep and didn't want to be disturbed. And he said, you're crazy, <laughs> you know, let me sleep. And Chuck didn't argue with him. He still wasn't sure what he was seeing, but these objects continued to pace his vehicle. And after a few minutes, one of them zoomed forward about a mile ahead and crossed the road from right to left, and hovered at an altitude of about 10 feet right next to the highway uh, as if waiting for them to approach. So Chuck again woke his brother. He says, hurry, wake up fast. You have to see this. So Jake or, uh, Dave woke up and look, he looked outside and could also see this object. And as they approached this object, which was uh, hovering to the left side of the highway now, it suddenly turned into a bright orange luminous ball. And I'll just quote Dave here. It says, Dave, at that moment, it felt like we had been hit by a blast of wind or a force field. It felt to me like a blast of wind hit the back of the truck and it felt like it just picked it up and we were floating. I was sitting there on the right hand side of the seat watching him and he just kept going like this with the truck and he couldn't steer it. He didn't have control of the truck. Uh, Chuck agrees. He was driving. He was struggling to regain control of, his, of the truck. And I'll just quote Chuck here. As Chuck says, The only thing I can com compare it with is if you take a curve or something on ice, how the truck sways from one side to the other. This is how it felt to me. But at the same time, the lights were flickering on and off. 
The motor was missing and I was losing power. I kept my foot on the gas and I was losing power. Now I want to tell you that what it felt like to me was, was that I was actually floating. It, the truck, was floating slightly off the highway in the air. None of the wheels were touching the highway. Uh, Chuck's brother Dave agrees. As Dave says, the lights on the truck flickered on and off and the engine started to miss. He lost control of the truck and couldn't steer it. I told him to stop and before we could stop, the transmission selector jumped out of drive into neutral and we coasted to a stop. At this point, the orange ball of light disappears. They get outside and they inspect the undercarriage of the truck and the drive shaft was actually still spinning even though the car was in neutral. <laughs> Uh, so that was weird. Uh, they got back in the truck, which was still running, and at this point they see uh, another object, a large silver-colored object shaped like a ball, but with a dome on top and what looked like kind of sharp wings. It was floating over a hill to their left, and at this point they saw another object, an ex extremely brilliantly lit object, and it was landed ahead of them in the center of the road. It covered the entire road. It was just this big, luminous light, enormous in size. Chuck turns to his brother and says, what in the hell is that? And Chuck says, I don't know. And uh, uh, Dave says, perhaps they're, pl you know, they're playing games with us. Uh, and Chuck definitely had the feeling that they were coming to get them. And they became very frightened. Uh, so... At some point, Dave jumps out of the car and starts approaching this object, and Chuck's screaming, no, no, get back in the truck. And Dave starts uh, getting really sca scared because uh, he says, and I'm quoting, we felt that we were in a vacuum of some kind and isolated from the rest of the world. You felt like you were trapped, in other words. You couldn't go back. I couldn't go forward. The truck wouldn't move. We were just sitting there waiting for something to change. So this face-off lasted for just a few minutes and uh, suddenly this object started turning red, sending off reddish beams of light and uh, suddenly whooshed by them, it just disappeared. And none of the brothers could tell exactly how it left. It just seemed to suddenly disappear really quickly. They estimate that the entire encounter lasted a full 20 minutes. So it's a pretty major encounter. Uh, the truck no longer worked, the U-Haul truck. Uh, they, they were stranded on the highway, uh, so they had to call a mechanic, and the mechanic was amazed at what he found. Uh, he sp investigators spoke with the mechanic, and the mechanic told them the back axle was twisted right off. Uh, it turned out that the drive shaft had been welded into the rear end, and when they tried to haul the truck away on a tow truck, the rear wheels just fell right off. So that truck was completely torn up. And uh, these are really, I think, significant and important physical effects. And a very extreme case, certainly, of which would, I think, be classified as a close encounter of the second kind. So yeah, now we're to the top 10. And the case I chose for number 10 is Contactee Truman Bethram. It's an incredible case, very controversial. Truman Bethram was a highway maintenance worker in Nevada. He was working in the Mormon Mesa area. And on July 27th, 1952, he was working the night shift, decided to take a break, and was driving around a very remote and deserted area of Mormon Mesa, pulled over to take a nap, and when he woke up, he was surprised to see 10 short men surrounding his car. They were wearing jumpsuits, had dark olive skin. He jumps out and can see that there's this 300-foot craft, a disc, metal, uh, sitting on the road next to him. So these men invite him aboard the craft, he says. On board, he met the pilot. She introduced herself as Aura Rains. Uh, she was wearing, uh, Bethram says, a black bodice, a black velvet bodice. 
a red pleated skirt and a beret. And uh, he says the inside of the craft was brightly lit and the captain, Aura, proceeded to talk a little bit about the ship so that they had others like then. Uh, he asked if they were from a foreign country and she said, no, we're interplanetary and we're visiting the Earth. And uh, it was just a very short meeting. She said, we have to end it now, but we will meet you again. And according to Truman, over the next three months, he had a total of 11 contacts, always in the same area, the desert area outside Mormon Mesa. And he was taken on board and would always have these short discussions. Uh, he never got a ride on board the craft. He asked, but they uh, refused. And the craft always remained landed. Uh, but he did get a bunch of information from Aura Rains. Uh, she told him that they come from a planet by the name of Clarion, which was located, quote, behind the moon. And uh, they talked about other planets in our solar system and claimed that they were habitable. This is something we've heard from other contactees, uh, which is strange because according to NASA and all our space probes, this is not the case. The planets are not inhabitable. Uh, so that's a strange detail that turns up in these early contactee cases. And th this and other details led a lot of researchers to just completely dismiss this case. Others uh, stand by Truman and believe that there is some authenticity to it. So it's definitely a controversial case. It became very popular. Uh, Truman Bethroom did provide one piece of physical evidence, a note, uh, that, which was allegedly written by Aura Rains. Uh, Leonard Stringfield, researcher Leonard Stringfield, met Truman Bethroom at a party and asked about the note and if it could possibly be chemically analyzed. And Truman evaded the question. So he wasn't particularly impressed, but other researchers were, as I said. Researchers Bryant and Helen Reeves, they wrote a book about uh, their investigations, Flying Saucer Pilgrimage. Uh, they went across the United States meeting directly, face-to-face -face with various contactees, including Truman Bathroom, and uh, they were very impressed with his uh, sincerity. And I'll just quote what they said about Truman's case. As uh, they wrote, We cannot, of course, directly verify Mr. Bethram's experiences because we were not present. All we can do is convey to you our own impressions of the man and his experiences as we discussed them with him. We were favorably and very deeply impressed with Mr. Bethram's unimaginative sincerity. Knowing the man as we do, may we state that we still regard his experiences as some of the greatest contributions in the entire saucer saga. So yeah, they were convinced. Truman told them that the book has, was ghostwritten and some of the details were not translated correctly. The author that he chose, he says, unfortunately dramatized some of the incidents played up sort of a romantic angle between him and the pilot, which was not true at all. Uh, so these and other details are, are what some of the skeptical researchers latched on <laughs> to sort of point towards this case being a hoax, which Truman has always denied, and there's never been any proof to prove that he's been hoaxing this. So I'm a bit on the fence about this case. I've got the book. I've read several times. Uh, I do find it's got some very interesting details to it. I picked this case because it was widely influential. He was very popular. He was just one of a handful of contactees of the 1950s who sort of ushered in the modern age of UFOs. So for that reason alone, I think it's an important case. Now we move to number nine. The case I chose for number nine is another Blue Book unidentified case. This one occurred at 3.40 p.m. on July 24th, 1952, over Carson Sink, Nevada. And uh, the main witnesses were both 
Air Force colonels. There was Air Force Lieutenant Colonel John McGinn and Colonel John R. Barton. They were both piloting a B-25 aircraft over Carson Sink at an elevation of 11,500 feet when suddenly they both spotted three strange aircraft ahead of them and to the right. And uh, these are both command pilots trained in aircraft recognition. And uh, at first, they assumed that they were looking at F-86 fighters, which were brand new. Uh, but these craft were in a strange V formation and were flying much higher than regulations allowed. And their B-25 was on a course that would take them much closer to the objects. And as they approached, they could see that these clearly were not fighter jets. Instead, they appeared to be, quote, bright silver delta wing craft with no details and no pilot's canopy. And it started to get much stranger. Not only did they appear weird, they were moving very strangely. As they watched, these objects suddenly turned to the left and approached their own aircraft to within 800 yards, you know, about 2,500 feet. This is very, very close for two aircraft. And after about four seconds, these craft darted away at super high speeds, at least four times the speed of a jet, they estimated, somewhere in excess of 1,000 miles per hour. So after they landed, both McGinn and Barton reported their sighting to Air Force officials, and because of their high level of rank and training, uh, their sighting drew quite a bit of interest from the Air Technical Intelligence Command at Wright-Patterson, the ATIC, and from the Pentagon in Washington. Uh, the pilots told the investigators that they had never seen any aircraft like this. Uh, there, a, an investigation followed, and it was determined that there were no other aircraft in the area, known aircraft. There were no balloons or any type of airborne devices. And this particular sighting was actually only one of a more than a hundred nationwide sightings on that day. And uh, at the time, Captain Ruppelt was heading Project Blue Book, and he wrote about this case. And he, he says, maybe the colonels actually did see what they thought they did, a type of craft completely foreign to them. So yeah, this is an important case, one of only four in Nevada that was declared unidentified by Project Blue Book, and uh, a real great case and hard to explain. The case I chose for number eight is a very weird case, uh, probably should be more well known than it is, I think, which is the contact of Johnny Sands. Johnny Sands was a country musician at the time, still is, and in mid-January of 1976, there had been a mini-wave of sightings over the city of Las Vegas, uh, where he was performing. Uh, this occurred around you know, 8 to 9 p.m. A bunch of people saw a large cigar-shaped craft moving over the city. And it was about two hours later at 10.30 p.m., when Johnny Sands uh, was driving along the Blue Diamond Road, returning to Las Vegas from Pahrump, uh, when he first saw a very strange object, which he said looked like the Goodyear blimp, only it was longer, it had flashing lights and bullet-shaped ends with a kind of darker donut-like ring around the fuselage. He said it was at least 60 feet long, orange in color, with portholes, and uh, was flashing these red and white lights. And he didn't pay much attention to it at first until it started to follow him down the road. Uh, and then his car engine started to sputter and fail. And he pulled over and parked to see what was wrong. And as he was examining his engine, uh, this craft came to a stop and hovered about a thousand feet over him. And he's looking up at it and turns back to his car, and at this point he notices two figures approaching him, two humanoid figures. 
Uh, he said that they were dressed in a black, silvery, overall type of uniform with a white stripe stretching diagonally from shoulder to hip. And they had a white kind of patent leather belt with all these multiple silver-colored capsule-shaped objects, each about one inch in diameter. And they stood about five feet tall, five feet seven inches, he said. Uh, they were bald with no hair. They had kind of squinty eyes and uh, looked very strange. They had kind of pug noses, very small mouths, uh, all a wrinkle, wrinkly face, and uh, their mouths never opened. Uh, their hands appeared very much human-like. As, as Sands told investigators, the face was wrinkled. Body-wise, he looked as fit as a 21-year-old, but in his face, his facial structure, something gave me the idea this guy was 300 or 400 years old. It was a very powerful face, a very powerful set of eyes. He's not so ugly as he was powerful looking. So uh, it, a very strange conversation followed. The ETs asked him all these very bizarre questions. They wanted to know why he was driving along this remote road. And uh, he explained that he was a performer on his way to do a show. And they asked him why all these people were clustered together, living together in one location in this city. And he explained that the city was a tourist attraction and that people liked to visit there. And they asked him how he communicated. Uh, he didn't understand the question, which they uh, kept asking him several times. And uh, they asked him other stuff, which he was, was very reluctant to divulge to researchers. Uh, they told him to not talk about this meeting, don't say anything. And uh, they told him that we, kn we know who you are and we will see you again. Though apparently this did not happen. This was his one and only encounter. Uh, he said that it had a strange mechanical-like quality to their voice and it appeared as if their voice was not originating from them so much as it was from an instrument attached to their body. Uh, so he refused to release certain details uh, which he had been sworn to secrecy about. This meeting was very short, he said about 10 minutes, at which point the ETs walked back out into the desert. After reaching a distance of about 200 feet, there was a bright flash of light and they disappeared as did the craft that was hovering overhead. So he called the police uh, to report what happened to him. Uh, the police referred him to Nellis Air Force Base. And uh, later, investigators did call Nellis and confirmed that uh, Nellis confirmed that Sands had, in fact, called them and had been interviewed by an Air Force officer of special investigations. Jim and Coral Lorenzen heard about his case and investigated it. Uh, also, Timothy Green Beckley uh, has done some really uh, extensive interviews, which you can still find on YouTube, uh, some face-to-face -face interviews with Johnny Sands. So yeah, it appears to be a legit case, very interesting. He did take a lie detector test, and according to the administrator, he was telling the truth, and I'll just quote here from the administrator of the lie detector test, who says, after careful examination of this subject's polygraph, it's my opinion that Mr. Johnny Sands was truthful in his answers to the above relevant questions. I am not attesting to the truthfulness of the whole story that Mr. Sands has told, only to the veracity of his answers to the above relevant questions. A very strange contactee case that I, I think a lot of people haven't heard about, uh, but very interesting to say the least. So the case I chose for number seven is fairly well known, I think. You may have heard of it. It's Charles Hall and his encounters with the tall whites. Charles Hall was a USAF weatherman, and in uh, March of 1965, he was assigned to Nellis Air Force Base 
as a weatherman at a location outside kind of Area 51 area, Indian Springs, Nevada, and uh, started to have some UFO sightings, which were very disconcerting and somewhat frightening at first, but he became more and more comfortable as they continued to appear, and the encounters became more and more dramatic and closer to him, uh, and he eventually started having face-to-face -face encounters with these humanoid figures who he described as tall whites. He said that they were white-skinned beings, bald, with large dark eyes, wearing jumpsuits. And when he first saw them, he was in denial that these could be ETs. But after many months um, and many contacts over a period of a couple of years, he came to accept their presence and become more comfortable with them and learned that he was apparently part of an experiment. His superiors knew about the tall whites and wanted to make contact with them. And so that's why, why he was there. He learned later that there were a number of other officers who were put in the position he was, and they quit. They left. They couldn't handle it. He was the only one who could handle it. He was in this position from March 1965 to May of 1967 and had many, many contacts with these tall whites, was eventually taken on board and had conversations with them. It's a long, fascinating story, uh, way too detailed to go in depth here. Uh, and the case is well known. He's done the lecture circuit. He's written a series of books called Millennial Hospitality, uh, which he initially published as sort of semi-fictional but now stands by them as truthful accounts of his own experiences uh, there in the Nevada desert. It's a very interesting story. Um, he says, as I mentioned earlier, that yeah, sometimes these ETs would actually uh, leave the area and travel into the city, Las Vegas, and actually go into casinos wearing disguises, you know, wearing wigs and wrap around sunglasses to hide their eyes, which did look unusual. Uh, they said that they chose the Nevada area because it was very similar to their own environment where they originated. It's a very interesting case. Uh, Charles James Hall has grabbed the attention of a lot of people in the UFO field and has, a pretty, has had a pretty strong impact. Uh, and it's never been proven a hoax. And a lot of people stand by him and he has really popularized the term tall whites. Uh, so yeah, very interesting and significant case for sure. And now we get to case number six, which I don't think is well known, but it comes from a great source, Leonard Stringfield. This is about a landing at Nellis Air Force Base. And uh, Leonard Stringfield published this in his first series of status reports about UFO crash retrievals and government encounters with UFOs. And he was able to uh, interview an Air Force sergeant who insisted on anonymity. Uh, this Air Force sergeant was stationed at Wright-Patterson in Ohio. He also interviewed a general uh, who also worked at Wright-Patterson and according to them, according to the Air Force sergeant, the sergeant was shown a top secret document uh, which was created by the general and it concerned a very interesting incident in 1968 in which a UFO, a metallic craft, uh, actually landed at Nellis Air Force Base. And according to the sergeant, this object had been seen hovering over the base for a period of three days in a row, three consecutive days. And on the third day, this large craft ejected uh, some smaller craft, three smaller objects. And one of these three craft actually landed on Air Force Base grounds. And when the craft landed on the tarmac and stayed there, a colonel was sent with an armed security force to approach the craft. And as they approached, a humanoid creature emerged from the craft. Uh, he was described as short and stocky. And at this point, a beam of light 
was emitted from either the craft or the being, striking the colonel, who immediately became motionless and paralyzed, he said. And the next officer in command ordered the security tro troops to actually open fire, at which point all of their guns mysteriously jammed. Uh, the colonel says that he saw a stream of weird symbols and numbers, equations, and all kinds of information, which was being kind of telepathically beamed into him. And after just a few moments, this beam retracted. Uh, the uh, being returned back to the craft, which took off and returned to the mothership, as did the other little craft, and the UFO left. The colonel was traumatized and actually had to be hospitalized, though he reportedly fully recovered. Leonard Stringfield was able to confirm the identity of the sergeant and the colonel, and as he says, and I'm quoting, obtained additional corroborative information concerning the Nellis AFB incident. So it seems to be a legit and important case, and is one of several in which our own government has had apparent of open official diplomatic relations with ETs. So this is the sort of incident that really should have been disclosed immediately, and our government should be transparent with this, and let us know that there is open official contact going on with ETs in military circles. Uh, clearly a very important case. The case I chose for number five is a very important case, which did not make the Blue Book unidentified list, which is absolutely ludicrous, and in fact caused quite a bit of controversy within Blue Book. This is a UFO landing outside of Tonopah, Nevada. It occurred on November 23, 1957, to First Lieutenant Joseph F. Long. He was about 30 miles west of Tonopah. Long was a member of the 97th Fighter Interceptor Squadron and had just completed his advanced survival school course at Stead Air Force Base. And he was driving back to his home in Delaware when suddenly his car mysteriously stalled. He exited his vehicle, at which point he could hear this high-pitched whining noise. And following the source of the noise, he was surprised to see four saucer-shaped objects landed on the ground about 300 yards uh, to the right of the highway. So he could instantly see these were not normal craft. Uh, he walked towards them and got about 50 feet away from the closest object. And as the official USAF report on the incident reads, and I'm quoting, they were disc-shaped, emitting their own source of light, causing them to glow brightly. They were equipped with a transparent dome in the center of the top, which was obviously not of the same material as the rest of the craft. The entire body of the objects emitted light. They did not appear to be dark on the underside. They were equipped with three landing gears, each that appeared hemispherical in shape, about two feet in diameter, and of the same dark material. Uh, th this report was written from the description of Officer long and uh, according to long the objects were about 15 feet high each of them had a dark rotating ring around the circumference uh, he tried to approach closer at which point the whining noise increased in pitch and the objects lifted up from the ground but landing gear retracted into the craft the object rose to about 50 feet of altitude and proceeded at a leisurely 10 miles per hour across the highway over some hills and disappeared off into the distance. So Long went to the area where they had landed and found several small impressions in the sand where the landing gear had rested. They were very shallow and bowl-shaped in a triangular pattern. He drove directly to Indian Springs Air Force Base and officially reported his encounter. Uh, his report 
was routed to Project Blue Book, uh, to J. Allen Hynek and the other officers. And according to J. Allen Hynek, uh, he felt like the officers at Project Blue Book were more worried about publicity from the case than investigating the case itself. And he said that the only reason they investigated the case was because, and I'm quoting, the damage and embarrassment to the Air Force would be incalculable if this officer allied himself with the host of flying saucer writers, experts, and others who provide the Air Force with count countless charges and accusations. In this instance, as the matter now stands, the Air Force would have no effective rebuttal or evidence to disprove any unfounded charges. So this was one case that really started to wake up J. Allen Hynek to the fact that Blue Book was not a true investigative body, but was in fact more interested in debunking cases, focusing on cases with prosaic explanations and trying to find a way out of cases that appeared to be legitimate or very dramatic. And in fact, in this case, they decided to look into the officer, officer Long's psychological state and did a psychological profile on him, seeing if there could be you know, some psychological reason for this report. And uh, they contacted a psychologist to examine him. And as the psycho psychologist wrote, this is indeed an unusual report. With one important exception, it has many of the characteristics of a deliberate hoax and reports of psychopathological cases. This exception was that it was made by an Air Force officer, a pilot, who presumably should be a most comp competent observer. On the basis of the evidence, I can only offer conjectures on the nature of the incident. The psychologist wrote that, quote, there was the possibility of a deliberate hoax, or it was possible that the officer was suffering from a temporary condition, such as sometimes been called road hypnosis, brought on by excessive fatigue and loss of sleep. So clearly the officers at Project Blue Book were fishing for a psychological explanation to debunk this case. And Hynek vehemently disagreed with this and wrote that this was typical of the Air Force to label an event as psychological while completely disregarding the evidence. As he writes, and this is Hynek talking, what is so frustrating in these kinds of cases, and particularly in this case, is the readiness with which a, quote, psychological explanation was grasped without adequate justification. So yeah, Project Blue Book, what a disaster. Very interesting case and should be well known and uh, definitely one of my favorite cases in Nevada. And here's another one of my favorite cases and it earned position number four. Uh, this case involves UFOs that observed a high altitude test flight. And in fact, this was a record breaking test flight. This was in 1962 when the Air Force was doing a series of high altitude flight tests using the X-15 aircraft. The X-15 aircraft is the highest altitude aircraft we have. It can reach altitudes of over 350,000 feet. It's also our fastest aircraft manned uh, without any rockets. Uh, and uh, this aircraft can reach speeds well in excess of 4,000 miles per hour, 4,500 miles per hour. So this was back in 1962 and we were setting records using this aircraft. And according to a source from Leonard Stringfield, the first encounter uh, during these fly altitude test flights occurred on April 30th, 1962. NASA pilot Joseph A. Walker was launched from Mud Lake in Nevada and was heading towards 
Edwards Air Force Base in California. He was climbing at a pitch of about 30 degrees, uh, climbing an altitude, and was at an altitude of about 200,000 feet uh, when two disc-shaped objects appeared. Walker immediately radioed the control room at Edwards Air Force Base and said, quote, two UFOs just passed overhead. According to Leonard Stringfield, at least 20 people overheard this radio message, and when the pilot landed, the aft fuselage camera was taken in for examination, and the footage turned out to be excellent and clearly showed two white silver disks flying in tight formation and overtaking the X-15 at about only 100, maybe 200 feet over his plane. So they were kind of showing off, I guess, uh, saying like, yeah, you think you can fly high? <laughs> Watch this. So this is a fly, you know, so high up that clearly this could not have been any other aircraft because the X-15 was the highest we could go. So clearly not us. And it was only a few months later, on July 17, 1962, that there was a re repeat performance. Again, uh, Air Force pilot Major Robert White launched his X-15 from North Del Mar Lake in Nevada, heading towards Edwards Air Force Base. And uh, this was another world record altitude flight. He reached a height of 314,000 feet when this time a group of six disc-shaped objects suddenly appeared in formation, circling around his aircraft. White, Major White described the objects as being very much uh, white, like the color of paper, and they paced his aircraft for several moments. He counted at least six, but said there could have been possibly as many as ten. So a very interesting case, which uh, remained covered up, except for the efforts of uh, Leonard Stringfield. Uh, so it's a really, really remarkable case, and uh, definitely one of the most important, I think, which occurred in Nevada. And now we get to the top three. And I'm sh sure you've heard of these cases, <laughs> but uh, they're amazing. And uh, the top three case that I chose is Art Bell's UFO encounter. Art Bell, as I'm sure you know, was a leading radio broadcaster. In fact, had the leading radio show in the world, Midnight in the Desert. Really neat guy. I was on his show twice before he passed away. And uh, he had always wanted to see a UFO. Um, in the 1990s, his show was hugely popular. It had like 15 million listeners, the most popular show in the United States. And in August of 1994, he and his wife Ramona had their own personal encounter over the Nevada desert. Uh, this was while he was driving from Las Vegas to Pahrump. It was 11.30 p.m. It was a clear sky, a nearly full moon, and Ramona noticed it first a dark object coming from behind them to the left. And she blurts out, what the hell is that? <laughs> and he stops the car, and they both stared in amazement as this huge, dark, triangle-shaped object floated overhead from southeast to northeast. It was moving at a slow, leisurely pace, much slower than a plane, and appeared to be at a very low, at an altitude of about 200 feet. There was a white strobing light in the front of a, the craft and two white lights uh, on the rear that were not blinking. It was totally silent, huge. He says at least 150 feet long and moved so slowly it took about 10 minutes for this object to traverse the valley. And at one point it sped up very quickly and darted, he said, towards Groom Lake and Area 51. And I'll just quote Bell directly here. This is Art Bell talking, as he says. It was silent, dead silent. It did not appear to have an engine. 
Maybe we have this kind of craft at Area 51. If we do, that's a big story. If it's not ours, then it's a big story. Either way, it's a big story. Uh, Art Bell's wife, Ramona, um, also uh, saw this object, as I said, and as she says, he always wants to see stuff like that, but it was one of those sights I could have really done without seeing for my whole lifetime. Uh, Art Bell was very deeply impressed by the sighting, but he remains agnostic about what it was, you know, whether it was ours or not. So Art Bell was very impressed by his encounter. He knew he had seen something that was unknown. He's not sure if it was military or not. Uh, but as he says, and I'm quoting again, it really doesn't matter that much to me if anyone believes me. Thousands of people seeing the same thing cannot be wrong. So yeah, I think it's an important case simply because Art Bell was so hugely, hugely popular and influential and really uh, got a lot of people to recognize that the UFO phenomena is very real indeed. So now we move to case number two, and it's an amazing case, uh, and I'm really surprised it's not more well known than it is. Uh, this is the Las Vegas UFO crash of April 18th, 1962. Uh, this has never been proven to be a hoax, and in fact, there are thousands, literally thousands of witnesses to this and official Air Force documentation and confirmation. It's an excellent case and uh, should be much more well-known than it is. Uh, this case began actually in the state of New York. In the town of Oneida, New York, numerous witnesses saw what they first thought was a meteor, a bright red fiery object moving eastward across the sky at very high altitude. And it was immediately tracked on radar uh, which was confirmed by the Air Defense Command, who alerted military bases in the area to check for this object. And reportedly, Air Force bases in Kansas confirmed the object's westward path. Soon other bases picked this up, bases in Montana, New Mexico, Utah, and Wyoming also tracked this thing on radar. And this thing was clearly not a meteor for a number of reasons. First of all, it was moving on a very shallow gliding path, getting lower and lower. Second, its speed was changing. It was, would move slower and then faster. Third, it was changing directions and moving in a random, meandering, zigzag pattern. So this was clearly not a meteor and the Air Force knew it from the very beginning uh, because of these weird details uh, due to the fact that it was zigzagging, slowing down, and moving in an incoming approach, a very shallow gliding approach. And so they were tracking this from oh, about a dozen Air Force bases, including, you know, as well, Idaho and California, Arizona, and of course, Nevada. Uh, two, two bases in particular uh, were tracking this thing. Luke Air Force Base in Phoenix, Arizona, and Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada. They both uh, launched jets, jet interceptors, to chase after this object. So they were, again, clearly convinced it was not a meteor. And uh, so they charted this thing moving in this weird zigzag pattern across the entire U.S. And by the time it w had reached Nevada, where it was apparently coming in for some sort of crash landing, uh, it had taken about a half hour, 32 minutes. So if this is true, th that meant its speed was somewhere around 4,500 miles per hour. Now, meteors move far, far faster than that, so this is definitely not a meteor. So if that's not enough, there are at this point hundreds and soon to be thousands of people, witnesses across the United States, who saw this. Uh, the first were in Oneida, New York. 
Uh, but people saw this all over the United States. Uh, it really became more visible in Utah. And uh, the first people in Utah to see it was were really the town of Nephi, N-E-P-H-I, or Nephi, Nevada. And uh, one reputable witness was Sheriff Raymond Jackson. He heard a very loud roar, looked up and saw this object, which he described as fiery and yellow-white, moved lo low overhead, and it was sending off a series of explosions. Uh, he said that these explosions were very loud and actually caused, had electromagnetic effects, caused the entire town to black out. There was a citywide power failure. So many, many witnesses saw this and they confirmed the same details that this object was exploding. Uh, some counted upwards of 20 or 30 of these explosions. One witness uh, is Maurice Mamat. He said that uh, this UFO was so bright it lit up the surrounding area like daylight. It was a very, very bright light. And they kept their eyes on this object, he and other witnesses near him. One witness was Dan Johnson. And they said this object appeared to briefly land on the ground about six miles away. So, yeah, clearly not a meteor because this object uh, did a controlled landing and then took off again. And after leaving uh, the town of Nephi, it took off and headed over Eureka, which was about 30 miles to the west, where more witnesses saw this. Uh, at that time, there was uh, two witnesses, Bob Robinson and Floyd Evans. They were driving through the town, and they watched it pass overhead. They said it was probably about 500 feet overhead and looked like a bright flaming object at, at first. But as it got close, they could see that this was actually a solid metallic object. And they could see portholes or square, squarish windows on the side of this object. And as it passed low over their car, their headlights dimmed and their car engine sputtered and almost died. So more electromagnetic effects. So just a few miles away, uh, Bob Robinson's wife, Betty, she was in their home when suddenly she heard this ro loud roar in the interior of her house lit up bright as daylight. And this is what all the other witnesses described, uh, including Eureka's police chief, Chief Joseph Bermini. He also saw it. This thing, this object was so bright that the street lights in the town actually uh, went out. Um, they became extinguished because this they all thought it was daylight. That's how bright this object was. So this object moved over the town of Eureka and into the town of or into the state of Nevada and moved over Reno. At, at, when it reached Reno, it, it turned southward and it was spotted descending to the <coughs> to the ground east of Las Vegas. It appeared to be like a huge flaming object. And this is when thousands of people in Las Vegas saw this thing. Thousands. Uh, Frank Maggio described this object as a tremendous flaming sword crossing the sky, making a series of explosions, disappearing east of the city. And uh, some witnesses could actually see this thing as it slowed down or sped up. And again, radar... Stations were tracking this thing as it got lower and lower, and at some point, it disappeared from their radar scopes. It disappeared right outside of the town of Mesquite, Nevada. This is the Mesquite Range, about 70 miles south of Reno. And when it disappeared from radar, just a few moments later, there was an enormous bright red-white explosion. Uh, it was a huge, huge explosion, so this is a huge case. Uh, the first investigator to really look into it and do an investigation was Frank Edwards, who was a leading UFO researcher at that time, the author of several books on UFOs. 
And Frank Edwards was very well connected. He had actually met the President of the United States, President Roosevelt, and uh, had a really a lot of connections at high levels. And so he investigates this case and uh, he became convinced it was, in fact, unusual and got all kinds of confirmation. And as Frank Edwards writes, the glare was so intense that witnesses said the streets of Reno were lighted as though by a gigantic flashbulb. The glare was reported from five states, and scientists in the area told newsmen that the flash was, in their opinion, some form of atomic explosion. So uh, there were other military officials who saw this. One was Captain Herman Gordon Shields, who was flying a C-119 over Utah and actually came upon the actual crash site, uh, which he said was bright enough to light the surrounding area and the terrain uh, for miles around. Uh, he said everything for the entire, the object itself was so bright you couldn't look at it and it lit up the ground for miles around. Um, he said it was, quote, bright as daylight. So many, many witnesses to this. His report would later be picked up by the Air Force and forwarded to Project Blue Book. Uh, there were people who reported it to MUFON as well. Uh, one report comes from a Civil Air Patrol field trip at Carson City High School. This was a school bus traveling with about 12 people, students, parents, and a teacher. They were traveling southbound on U.S. Highway 95 uh, in Nevada, and the object was first sighted on the western horizon moving eastward across the sky. It moved out of sight behind some hills. It was brilliantly lit and illuminated everything within the visible horizon. And uh, it was actually bright enough like for daylight. They said you could read a newspaper if you wanted. Uh, they heard no sound, uh, but did not think it was a meteor either because it was, there was no smoke, no tail. Uh, and uh, this object was moving too slow. It took about two minutes or so to cross the duration of the sky. Uh, and they watched this object as it moved uh, behind the hills to the east, and it got dark, and uh, it didn't see it anymore, but about a minute or two later, there was an enormous bright flash. So they apparently saw this thing at its actual final crash site, uh, the, or the explosion, rather. Uh, they were concerned about a fire, and they actually went searching for this the next day, but were not able to find any trace of it because unknown to them, it was actually much farther away than they saw, thought. Uh, this th thing was, yeah, yeah, in Mesquite. So meanwhile, the Clark County Sheriff's Office in this area was instantly swamped with calls from people who had a, reported this explosion. They sent out a search party. They conducted a ground search all night long and the next day looking for aircraft, but were unable to locate any evidence of this. Meanwhile, reporters uh, all across Reno and other areas were uh, trying to get information on this incident, so they called up Nellis Air Force Base. And Nellis Air Force Base was surprisingly transparent and forthcoming, and said they released a short statement saying that uh, they had actually tracked this object and that it was not a meteor. And later they released another statement uh, this was from Lieutenant Colonel Herbert Rolf of the North American Air Defense Command at Colorado Springs in Colorado. Uh, they are responsible for tracking all the aircraft moving in and out of the United States. And he revealed that this object had in fact been observed and caught on radar all the way from New York to Nevada, and that this, the radar readings revealed that it could not have been a plane or a missile or a meteor, or anything conventional. So there was going to be some real good confirmation of this incident. So meanwhile, reporters contacted uh, Stead Air Force Base, and officials at Stead Air Force Base, an Air Force spokesman there, 
confirmed the incident, and I'll just let Frank Edwards uh, say what he found out. This is Frank Edwards uh, talking, as he wrote, The Air Force spokesman at Stead Air Force Base admitted that the object had landed and that the power substation had not been in operation during the 42 minutes the object was on the ground near it. He also told newsmen that the presence of this object had not been admitted to newsmen until the power station was in operation again after the object left. So reporters were definitely on some real good leads here. Uh, they contacted the Atomic Energy Commission who con made a statement to the media that they had not conducted any nuclear tests in this area at that time. So about two weeks after this event, on May 8th, Project Blue Book was commissioned to look into this event. And uh, the head of Project Blue Book at this time was Major Robert Friend. J. Allen Hynek was a part of Project Blue Book. And uh, they did a very cursory examination of the evidence. I just read a couple of eyewitness reports from some of the major military witnesses or the more higher credible witnesses and did not even travel to the actual location of the incident. According to their report on the incident, and this was actually released by Major C. Hart, the Air Force Public Information Officer, the Air Force said that there was, quote, insufficient data to reach a conclusion and that they believed the project, the object seen was probably, quote, a U-2 or high-level balloon. Now, this is utterly ridiculous, and researchers have completely debunked this explanation. There's no way it could have been a plane due to the Air Force's own prior admission <laughs> confession. So here, this is clearly a case of them trying to backpedal and get, get out of this situation. Uh, they got the date of the incident wrong. They labeled it as two separate incidents. They clearly bungled this uh, very badly. And according to Richard Dolan, one of several researchers who have looked into this incident, Richard Dolan says that their handling of this was so, quote, slippery and misleading that intentional deception seems likely. And, uh, yeah, their explanation of a U-2 or a balloon, he says, is clearly not credible. As he says, all of the claims and suggestions in this letter were entirely wrong. A U-2 is fast, but not Mach 7 fast. And balloon, as an alternate explanation, was nonsensical. Their respective movements and speed were totally distinct. So clearly not a balloon or a U-2. Uh, and in fact... Uh, contained in the Blue Book file on this case is the report of Douglas Crouch, the Chief of Criminal Investigations at Hill Air Force Base in Utah. In his report, he wrote, Preliminary analysis indicates that each of the observers interviewed were logical, mature persons, and that each person was convinced that he had observed some tangible object not identifiable as a balloon or conventional type aircraft. The theory that the object was a manned aircraft was abandoned due to the, the described shaped and colored flaming tail of the object, plus the fact that there were no reports of missing aircraft in the area. No unusual meteorological or astronomical conditions were present, which would furnish an explanation for the sighting. No missile test firings are conducted in the immediate area other than static tests, the hypothesis that the object was a falling meteor is questioned due to the flat trajectory of the object. So you can see that there was a disagreement among Blue Book officers themselves due to, as to the nature of this object. Ultimately, the Blue Book official explanation was meteor. <laughs> Totally ridiculous. So yeah, Frank Edwards was the first one to really look into this. 
He wrote an article for Fate magazine, which was published in August of that year. And he himself was frustrated by the complete lack of media coverage on this event. Initially, there was lots of newsmen who were interested, but the story just died out very quickly. And uh, he could not understand why this was not front page news. This again seems to be a deliberate cover up. And as Frank Edwards writes, and again, I'm quoting him directly here, here was a case where flustered officials confirmed that an object beyond their control had crossed most of the United States, had landed beside a power station, which remained useless until the object took off, pursued by armed interceptors. While under this pursuit, the object had admittedly exploded with a brilliance visible over five states. Quite a story, but most people never heard of it, for the simple reason that the news services did not carry the report. I recount the story here because of its obvious importance, both from the standpoint of what happened and because of the subsequent disappearance of the story on a national basis. Another researcher to look into this case is, of course, researcher Kevin Randall of Roswell fame. And Major Randall did a very thorough investigation and was able to talk to several first-hand witnesses. And despite being skeptical of some of these other crash retrieval events, uh, Major Kevin Randall says unequivocally that this was not a conventional aircraft and he believes it was a craft from another world, flat out. As he writes in his uh, book on UFO crash retrievals, and I'm quoting here, something extremely extraordinary happened on the night of April 18, 1962. The Air Force offered a series of explanations ignoring the facts, but the witnesses who were there know the truth. They saw something from outer space and it was not a meteor. It was a craft from another world. So yeah, he uh, was able to interview many people who were involved in this incident and says he actually interviewed a person who was involved in the recovery of this craft. And according to his source, following the crash, he and 30 other people were driving out to the location of the craft the next day they were loaded onto a bus with blacked out windows. They were all, you know, uh, part of a team of crash retrieval Air Force agents. And uh, one of the windows, according to the Randall source, had a tiny little peephole scratched out of it. And he could see this saucer shaped craft through this little peephole, which had apparently crash landed and was very badly damaged. And uh, these 30 witnesses were all let out, you know, and uh, given the task of retrieving this wreckage, which was carried off to a secret military base. So here we have another witness from Kevin Randall who saw the actual crash site itself. But here's where the story goes dry. And as Frank Edwards says, it was just not published really at all in the media. It just dried up. It's a very significant case, and to this day, no one has been able to explain what this object was other than as an extraterrestrial craft. Many investigators have looked into this incident. Uh, as I said, Richard Dolan was convinced this was a real incident, and as he writes, this much is clear. A UFO did crash or explode near Las Vegas on the evening of April 18, 1962, and the Air Force hid the event from the public and in its official records. Precisely what crashed remains unknown, but the pursuit of the object by U.S. jets appears to preclude natural phenomenon or American experimental aircraft as the explanation. So that's the number two case, and I think its spot is well earned. And now we move to the number one case in Nevada, uh, I think some of you already know what, what this is, and I'm sure all of you have heard of it. I'd say it's probably the most controversial and complex case in Nevada, by far, and this is Area 51. It goes by many names. It's 
called Dreamland, Paradise Ranch, The Ranch, uh, Skunk Works, Groom Lake, Watertown. Uh, it's got nicknames for the people who work there, like Out of Town or Nowhere, uh, The Remote Location, uh, The Box, S4. So it goes by a number of different names. Uh, it's a huge, vast area north of Las Vegas. Uh, basically the Nellis Air Force Base complex. And uh, officially this base didn't exist for many years. I mean, it was never talked about, wasn't on the maps. It was a no-fly zone for all civilian and commercial aircraft. And uh, in the 1990s became this real sort of magnet for UFO buffs because UFOs were being seen so often coming in and out of this area. What I found in my research for UFOs over Nevada, a book I wrote on this case, uh, or on all the cases in Nevada, is that a lot of the UFO sightings uh, originated or had something to do with Area 51. Many of the people who were seeing UFOs in Nevada were seeing them on the outskirts of this vast, vast area, which is huge. A lot of people don't realize that the state of Nevada is largely federally owned. In fact, 86% of the state is federally owned. That's more than any other state. And the area of uh, Area 51 is so vast, it would take you days and days and days to drive around it. Uh, so th this is a very interesting twist, I think, to the whole UFO situation in Nevada. And it makes the Area 51 story so incredibly complex and amazing. So in the 1990s, the, the Area 51 story really began in the late 1980s, around 89, when physicist Robert Lazar went public with his story of working there and being commissioned to uh, examine about nine extraterrestrial craft and learn their propulsion systems. And uh, he started bringing people to actually see these objects being test flown in and around the base. So this really caused a lot of attention and uh, the Area 51 story really exploded onto the scene and it became very controversial. But the whole story of course goes much back much farther than that. Officially the area, the location was opened in 1954 the vast dry lake bed of Groom Lake, Area 51 was established then and had at least 38,000 acres, 39,000 acres. And this is where the U-2 spy plane was developed, the Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird. And throughout the 1970s and 80s, the B-2 stealth bomber and the F-117A Nighthawk fighter were both constructed and tested here. So this is where we did a lot of our secret aircraft work. So by the mid-1980s, aviation enthusiasts and UFO buffs were beginning to hike up to this area to observe these strange craft and figure out what they were. And uh, rumors really began to fly that this, these were extraterrestrial craft when Robert Lazar went public with his story. He was worked there for about 15 months. Uh, he was taken into the space in a bus with blacked out windows. And uh, he saw all kinds of amazing things. He says he got the job in December of 1987 after being approached by Naval Intelligence. And they offered him the job to work there. Um, it stemmed from Lazar having met with Edward Teller earlier at Los Alamos in New Mexico. And so Lazar agreed to work there, worked there for the next 15 months. And uh, while at the base, he was very closely watched, given physical examinations and uh, given sodium pentothal and hypnotized and made to drink weird liquids as all parts of security measures. <clears throat> And he says he was charged with the duty of reverse engineering the propulsion systems of various UFO craft that were being held at Area 51. He was shown books about the alien races, shown photographs of their bodies and their craft, autopsy reports, 
Uh, he was told an alternate history of the, US, the human race from the viewpoint of the ETs, who called uh, humans containers. And uh, so it's a very interesting story, which yeah, you can find a lot of information out in different areas. Um, reportedly, the ETs have been interfering with our race for a long time and have made over 60 genetic corrections to the development of the human race over a period of thousands of years. And uh, he saw nine separate ET craft, which he said were clearly made for very small people because the chairs were really small. And uh, he, of course, talks about element 115, element 115, uh, which is used to amplify gravity waves, which is how these craft are run. At that point, element 115 was unknown. We do now know about that element. And everything that Lazar said is being confirmed presently at this time. Um, he was initially uh, got a lot of, uh, a, I would say, uh, not debunking, but certainly attacks on his character and uh, on his story. But before long, lots of other people were coming out with very similar information from what's going on at Area 51. Uh, so at some point, Lazar, he left the uh, base, no longer worked there, it was too intense, but he would take other people up in the surrounding area and show them these UFOs, he said, that were taking off and landing and being piloted by humans and that there was reverse engineering. He went public with his story and he really broke the whole Area 51 story wide open with the help of researchers John Lear and especially George Knapp. So he started bringing uh, them up there and they observed UFOs and this brought in a lot of other witnesses and soon that became the thing to do is uh, go up to the area surrounding Area 51 and uh, look for UFOs. Of course, the Air Force started nabbing up more acreage around the area, making this harder and harder to do. And uh, it was too late at this point. The Area 51 story had exploded, and people were flocking to this area in large numbers to see these UFOs. I mean, there was one UFO that appeared so often that it was called Old Faithful. It was uh, very predictable. So George Knapp grabs the bull by the horns and publicizes this story and, and breaks it wide open and started getting a lot of other witnesses. He's interviewed dozens of people who have confirmed uh, his, basically what Bob Lazar said. As George Knapp says, the story about alien technology in Nevada did not begin with Bob Lazar, nor does it end with him. Uh, he's interviewed many people who told him about wreckage being taken from to Area 51, including the Roswell craft. And uh, he spoke about more than 20 separate witnesses he's interviewed who have contributed information about what's going on there. Uh, one guy was in charge of video documentation and he saw actual test flight of an uh, alien craft. One was a bio biologist who was, his job was to test the alien tissue samples. There was radar operators, radar technicians who confirmed that there were unknown objects zipping around at speeds of 7,000 miles per hour. George Knapp was the researcher who really broke the Area 51 story wide open. But at this time, other whistleblowers were coming forward. One went by the code name Condor. We now know his identity as Captain Robert M. Collins. And according to Condor, Area 51 was the location of reverse engineering of UFOs. But also, he said that aliens and humans were working together, live ETs, and that the ETs had made a secret treaty with the US government where the ETs were allowed to sort of conduct their operations, meaning abductions, and in exchange, the U.S. got advanced alien technology and help in reverse engineering it. 
So yeah, according to researcher Robert Hastings, Condor was the code name for Captain Robert M. Collins, uh, who went live on TV, actually, during the UFO cover-up live television program. And so reportedly, he said that Area 51 goes down many, many levels, and that each succeeding story requires a higher security clearance to uh, enter, and that the bottom levels are only accessible to those with the very highest levels of security clearance, and uh, this is where you start to find the ETs working with humans. Uh, there was another researcher who was actually an aviation researcher, an aviation writer by the name of James Goodall, who started to get reports from people in Area 51, Groom Lake. And he asked one employee, flat out, a 12-year-long employee, if he believed in UFOs. And the employee replied, absolutely, they do exist. And uh, J James Goodall asked, would you please expand on that? And his source was unable to, said he's not allowed, but later did tell Goodall that, quote, we have things in the Nevada desert which would make George Lucas envious. So Goodall knew other employees at the base and was able to get little bits and pieces out about what's going on out there. He talked to a chief master sergeant uh, who served three tours at Groom Lake, and this sergeant told Goodall, and I'm quoting, we have things out there that are literally out of this world, better than Star Trek or anything you can see in the movies. Researcher Linda Moulton Howe uh, says that she has interviewed some Area 51 insiders, uh, including a retired military officer who told her, quote, the alien technology is so advanced and the beings are so strange that no one would believe it. Keeping the public and media away from what's really happening isn't difficult. It's a story no one wants to tell that no one knows how to tell. The truth is stranger than fiction. Many researchers have got information about Area 51. Colonel Wendell Stevens, a very well-respected researcher, is no exception. He interviewed an Area 51 security guard who went public, Derek Hennessy, who said that the base had at least four levels that he knew of and that military personnel were actually forbidden from entering the bottom two, which were for ETs only, uh, or mostly ETs. Uh, he said that alien bodies and alien craft are definitely being held there, as well as live extraterrestrials who actually live on the base uh, he heard, Hennessy, heard that scientists had been unable to learn how to operate most of these craft. And uh, Stevens was absolute, Colonel Wendell Stevens was convinced by Hennessy's story uh, for a number of reasons, including the fact that he had already interviewed other Area 51 insiders and had uncovered similar information and got a lot of corroboration from Derek Hennessy. Uh, one Area 51 insider has gone public. Uh, he, he goes by the name Bill Uhouse. I've talked to him personally. Uh, he seemed very sincere to me. And uh, he says that he worked directly at Area 51. He was a military mechanical design engineer uh, who researched the flying craft at Area 51. He asked his superiors if he could talk publicly about his experiences and was actually given permission, he said, which I find very interesting. And according to Uhouse, uh, the humans, yeah, were unable to fly most of these craft, or, or really any of them, but uh, says that they were able to reverse engineer some of the technology to improve our own craft. He says he worked with, directly with gray aliens on at least 20 occasions get the, needed, the data he needed to do his own research. As he says, we took their avionics and transferred them to our science and technology and used the avionics we know. Now, Uhouse says that the ET that he usually was matched up with went by the name of J-Rod. Or as uh, Uhouse says, 
I called him J-Rod, of course. That's what they called him. The alien used to come in with Dr. Edward Teller and some of the other guys occasionally to handle questions that maybe we'd have. Bill Uhouse describes J-Rod as being, quote, his skin was pinkish, but a little bit rough, that kind of stuff. Not horrible looking, uh, but to me, he wasn't horrible looking. Uhouse says that when he was there, he worked on about two or three dozen UFO craft of various sizes and feels that these craft were in fact now are being uh, piloted by humans who are taking them into space. So we've been able to reverse engineer enough to build our own UFOs and are now flying them around is what U-House is saying. And uh, there are a lot of whistleblowers and a lot of researchers coming out. Uh, Bill Hamilton is another prominent researcher who has uh, written about UFOs. And he had an abduction, actually, outside of Area 51. Uh, he's also interviewed Area 51 insiders. Uh, he says that he interviewed a lady who says that she was actually abducted as a young child and as an adult and was taken into the underground levels of Area 51. Uh, she, the witness he spoke with said that a number of women are taken there for hybridization projects. And he believes that the greys are acting under the control of reptilians and that the ETs again are working alongside humans to abduct women or experiment upon them. Or at least this is what his witness told him. Uh, so he's interviewed a number of other witnesses at Area 51, including a radio technician who saw a landed saucer on the ground, said it was about 20, 30 feet wide and totally silent when it went through the air. Um, other witnesses have gone public. One appeared on the Billy Goodman radio show. He explained that he was hired on the base as an electrician and while there was taken to deep underground tunnels to work and saw doctors in white lab coats transporting four little alien bodies on gurneys. And afterwards, he was harshly intimidated by security guards uh, and threatened not to talk. But this guy told Billy Goodman that he knew of 50 other people who worked at the base who were excited that Lazar had gone public as they felt the public had a right to know what was going on there. Uh, one alleged insider is the nephew of Admiral Richard Byrd, who is you know, well known for flying over the Arctic and the hollow earth theory, a uh, very controversial figure for sure, um, as is Harley Byrd, his nephew, who claims to have inside information about Area 51. Harley Byrd says that he served at the Pentagon in the late 1950s, early 1960s, and got a very high level uh, Secret Clearance, Ultima 3, he says, which gave him access to Area 51. And he believes there are seven levels to Area 51, with the main, the top level for transportation. Level 2 is for aliens and cryonics. And uh, this is where he says ETs are working along. And you can, workers there see ETs walking around, hybrids as well. But the bottom levels, he says, are much darker, and this is where genetic experiments go on, mutilations, and you know things like this. Um, level six and seven, the lower levels are where the greys and the ETs are using, uh, doing genetic experiments and trying to procreate their race. Level seven, he says, is even worse, and this is where the uh, reptilians are. And uh, he says he's per pretty worried about them. And of course, there's the series of books by Charles James Hall, the Millennial Hospitality Series, which I already mentioned. Uh, he goes into quite a bit of detail with the tall whites, which seems to confirm that there's weird activity going on in this area. To me, one of the most interesting whistleblowers coming out of Area 51 uh, was a colonel, a colonel whose story actually was written in the book Rachel's Eyes by Helen 
Littrell. If you have not read this book, Rachel's Eyes, I highly recommend it. It's incredible. Helen Littrell got involved in this whole story when her daughter went to school and had a roommate who turned out apparently, allegedly, to be an ET hybrid from Area 51 who was being taught how to live on the outside world. And it's an incredible story. And Helen Littrell uh, was able to meet this hybrid on one occasion. Her daughter, who roommate, was a roommate with her, was actually uh, legally blind, so it was able to work out where they lived together for a number of months. At any rate, Helen Littrell also talked to the colonel who was trying to uh, take this hybrid into the outside world. This hybrid girl, Rachel, was brought back into the fold or wherever they keep their hybrids there at Area 51. But the amazing part of the story is what the colonel, uh, who she calls Colonel Nadine, told Helen Littrell. Uh, he told Helen that he had joined the Air Force at a very early age and was assigned to the ATIC, Air Technical Intelligence Center, and uh, had no family, um, just a guy alone in the world. His security clearance was upgraded until he found himself in a secret military complex about 80 miles south of Eli, which is really the northern edge of the vast Area 51 complex. He said most of the facility was underground, and the purpose of it was to retrieve the ETs and UFO craft that were either landing on purpose or were being shot down by the military. And he says there were numerous craft which crashed or would just land there, and they would go in reconnaissance with them. So it's an amazing, amazing story, which I won't get too deeply into. You should definitely read the book. So there are many reports coming out of Area 51 from various eyewitnesses, little puzzle pieces everywhere. Here's a little uh, case, which I don't think a lot of people have heard. This comes from an anonymous witness who reported her experience to MUFON. She said that she and her husband were flying across the U.S. in 1956. Her husband had a top secret clearance and they were flying to L.A., Los Angeles. And the plane was coming in for a landing. This is the middle of the night, a moonlit night. And her husband was asleep. This is no one else on the plane. This is a deadhead flight. And uh, she realized looking out the window that this was not an air terminal. This was not any airport she recognized. It uh, looked like some sort of army base, she, uh, perhaps Area 51, is what she now speculates because of what she saw. She saw that this was a large complex with many hangars and single-storied buildings, and uh, she saw one of these hangars and it was wide open. And I'll just let her describe what she saw. As she says, that's when I saw the large hangar with its dar doors completely open and all the lights on. Inside stood a saucer-shaped disc that filled the center of the hangar. It had a clear dome on the center and stood on three legs. Various objects were attached, protruding out from the edge and underside, and the words United States Air Force were painted on the top of the disc near the saucer's edge. I was shocked but completely fascinated. I didn't believe in UFOs or saucers. But here was one about 150 feet. Here was one about 150 to 200 yards from me in plain sight. She tried to wake up her husband, but uh, he wouldn't wake up, and uh, the stewardess refused to answer her question when she asked where they landed, and just said that they had to make a quick drop off. And so they took off and landed in Los Angeles. When she got there, she asked her husband about it, and he became very angry and, and warned her never to speak about it ever again and that he was endangering her job or his job. So she agreed and didn't speak about it uh, for over 50 years and kept silent. But uh, she finally went public um, and said that this is what she saw. So there's so many bits of information. I mean... There was that time somebody called into the Art Bell Show 
uh, panicking. He was this guy who claimed to have uh, worked at Area 51. And uh, I won't get too into the call. It's a very famous call. But what this guy uh, said basically is that what we think of as aliens are actually uh, extra dimensional beings and uh, that they are not what they claim to be and that they have actually infiltrated deep into our military, especially at Area 51. And he claimed that all kinds of terrible natural disasters are coming and uh, that there's going to be a lot of really big changes coming up in our future. He was weeping during this entire call. Uh, so lots of weird stuff going on at Area 51, to say the least. And let me just close it with this kind of really, really weird story, which comes actually from Fate Magazine. Fate Magazine decided to do an experiment. This was in February of 2003, and they wrote a little article asking anyone that they knew to psychically, any of their fans, their readers, to psychically view Area 51 and see what they could see. Uh, see if they could, uh, re you know, remote view it or have an out-of-body experience or get re psychic impressions. And the results were truly amazing. They really were. They got a number of responses. Uh, interestingly, almost all of them were uh, women. Uh, all, you know, no men. Uh, but they all reported basically what a, these whistleblowers have been reporting all along. And it was really, really interesting. One of the ladies, Catherine from Virginia, said the base was organized into four main areas, genetic experimentation, reverse engineering, also food enhancement, and the other was hybridization. They also did studies on art and culture and that there was a species known as, quote, the ancient ones who resided in the lower, lowest levels, and they had the ability to do time travel. Another lady, Phyllis from Indiana, said that they were doing experiments involving magnetics and levitation and could actually make objects turn invisible and were also doing experiments with time travel. Another witness, Frances, she said... She could see the base in great detail, saw many hangars with large tunnels, and uh, that alien craft were, would travel through these tunnels to the lower levels of the base. Uh, Mary of Arizona said that she had a psychic impression of being inside very large cavernous rooms, and she saw what appeared to be intergalactic vehicles with a shimmery metallic sheen, and that the interior of the craft was kept very cool. Carol of Michigan, she reported back her impressions as a professional clairvoyant. And she saw some very interesting things. She saw people being transported to Area 51 by buses and planes. She saw many of these hangars held craft. She said that the base is several levels deep and that each level is devoted to a different area of research, which is exactly what other whistleblowers have said. She said level one is really just admission, administration and security. Level two was for alien encounters and communications, which is, that's what uh, Admiral, or, uh, uh, Admiral Byrd's nephew had said. So that's interesting. Uh, she said that level four was for medical experimentation. Level six was experiments to make new substances and materials. And level eight and stuff, uh, she said levels eight through ten were for the much more secure stuff that included germ warfare and things like this. Uh, and she felt, and this I found very interesting because I had not heard this from any of the other whistleblowers. She said that she felt some of the employees at the base were actually genetically enhanced by the aliens themselves. So that I thought was very interesting. Uh, so a number of reports, let me just tell you a couple of more. Patricia from New Mexico, she said that she could see the hangars on the base and they held very shiny metallic silver ships. She also saw gray ETs walking through corridors 
and uh, she, she was traveling while out of body, and she was very surprised to see that the greys were actually aware of her presence and did not like it. They were very host hostile and resentful and did not want her you know, getting this information out. <laughs> so that was pretty interesting. Another witness was Kathleen of Vermont. Uh, she had very similar impressions. She said that the base went many levels deep, that there were gray ETs there, and she also had the distinct impression that they could sense her and were watching her closely. I'll just quote Kathleen directly. She says, They know that I and others are here. There is anger, malice, meanness, and a frustrated inability to stop us. So again, she's verifying what the other witness said, that the greys were not happy that they were being spied on by humans. Uh, she said that there was definitely hybridization going on there uh, to make humans adaptable to space travel. She felt that innocent uh, um, humans had actually been abducted and taken to the base and had become victims of genetic experiments. So that's interesting. That's pretty much what Bill Hamilton's first-hand witness had said. Uh, she also sensed higher-level employees of the base had been genetically altered and enhanced using alien technology, which is very interesting because that's what the other witness, the professional clairvoyant, Carol, had said. So there's more confirmation that these employees are being implanted in some way or altered. Uh, another witness, just one more, is Teresa of Nevada, Carson City, Nevada. Uh, and she saw also that innocent citizens were being abducted and taken to the base for medical and hybridization experiments. Uh, she said that some of the employees of the base work in close cooperation with the ETs and have been given ET technology to give them a longer life. So here we have, again, employees being physically altered. As Teresa says, they have been mated with robotic parts that perform vital functions until these people are nearly immortal. She says that mo mostly the space is devoted to hybridization and genetic experiments, she thinks, to make people adaptable to life on other planets, which is what we're seeing again. So yeah, that's very cool, the psychic impressions of Area 51. So I definitely believe that uh, there is all kinds of stuff going on at Area 51. So more and more information continues to come out about Area 51, more evidence that it's real. Um, some very exciting events happened in 1994 when George Washington University law professor uh, and attorney Jonathan Turley decided to represent a small group of about half a dozen Area 51 employees who were suffering very severe health problems as a result of their time working at Area 51. They claimed to have been worked at Area 51 and had been exposed to hazardous materials which were ca causing a wide variety of health ailments and, in one case at least, uh, death of the witness. So Turley agreed to take on the case and soon realized he had gotten himself in very hot water. Uh, he kept encountering obstacle after obstacle, he, uh, especially involving some of these deceased workers. For months, the Air Force told him he had no case because the witnesses claimed to be working at Area 51 and Air Force said that there was no such place as Area 51, that Area 51 did not exist. And so Turley was able to obtain evidence that Area 51 did, in fact, exist. And uh, as soon as he did, the government would take the evidence and they would promptly classify it. So at this point, he realized what he was up against, and he decided if they were going to play dirty, so, so would he. So he threatened to call forth another witness he had, a witness at a Russian embassy military att attaché, who told Turley that he would be happy to disclose under oath what Russian military intelligence had learned about Area 51. 
And incredibly, this tactic seemed to work. The Air Force relented and did officially tell uh, Jonathan Turley uh, in regards to this case that there was, quote, an operating location near Groom Lake where these plaintiffs were employed. So the government, of course, had an attorney, Lieutenant Colonel Richard Sarver, and he was asked to comment on the case, but he said, quote, it would be wrong to address anything of substance. There is an answer, but I can't give it to you. It's classified. So this case started to get a lot of attention. Uh, Jonathan Turley really you know, took this case to the public to try to get some movement on it. And the Air, For Air Force, as a result, released an official statement actually admitting to the existence of Area 51, saying, in part, we do have facilities within the complex near the dry lake bed of Groom Lake, which are used for testing and training technologies, operations and systems critical to the effectiveness of the United States military forces. Specific activities conducted at Nellis cannot be discussed any further than that. So it took four years for a ruling to come out on this case. This was in January of 1998 and an appellate court protected the government, de declaring that everything involved at the base was a state secret, uh, which, include how's, which includes how the base handles toxic materials. The judge ruling on the case, Judge Pamela Ann Reimar, uh, wrote that the government may use the state's secrets privilege to withhold a broad range of information Accordingly, if seemingly innocuous information is part of a classified mosaic, the state secret's privilege may be invoked to bar its disclosure. So the court found that the information surrounding this case was actually so sensitive that they ended up classifying Turley's entire office and all his files and everything to do with that, that he touched. Anyone even inspecting his office would be charged with... Uh, violating national security laws. So, yeah, that's the story of Jonathan Turley and what happened when he tried to tackle <laughs> Area 51. So, yeah, the judge ruled in favor of the government on this case. She did order the Environmental Protection Agency to do an inspection, but the judge ruled that following this in inspection, the results were not to be publicly disclosed as long as an executive presidential order is passed exempting the disclosure. So all kinds of uh, interesting tidbits come out. You know, on September 20th, 1999, President Clinton uh, actually renewed this executive order exempting the base for environmental laws. He first signed it in 1998. So the whole Area 51 is so bizarre because at some point it has become a tourist attraction and the government, the Nevada government, latched onto this. In May of 1995, Assemblyman Roy Neighbors introduced a bill to change the name of State Route 375 to the Extraterrestrial Highway, apparently in a bid to gather more tourist attractions. And it passed. On April 18th, 1996, it passed. And the highway is now named, a 98-mile section of this highway is named the Extraterrestrial Highway. And even more recently, there's more information coming out with Senator Harry Reid of Nevada. In 1993, after Groom Lake had been making all sorts of land purchases, uh, Senator Reid was given a tour of the base. And uh, people were really hopeful he would do some disclosures. And when asked, all, his only comment was, no comment about what is going on at Area 51. But now he is making comments on a lot of really inter interesting information in which he appears to uh, pretty much say that, yeah, UFOs are real and our government is working with them and uh, they, it's time for them to disclose. So hopefully... More information will be coming from his corner. In 2013, President Obama made history. He was at the Kennedy Center Honors 
giving a tribute speech to Shirley MacLaine, and during his speech, he actually mentioned Area 51. As he says, now, when you become first president, one of the first questions that people ask you is what's really going on in Area 51? When I want to know, I'd call Shirley MacLaine. And uh, later, President Obama uh, com made a comment on this and said, I think I just became the first president to ever publicly mention Area 51. How's that, Shirley? I think he knew exactly what he was doing. I think he was trying to disclose in a way uh, that he could do without getting in trouble. Hard to say, only he knows. The Area 51 is definitely Nevada's biggest story, but as you can see, it's not the only one. So that's my list for the top 20 UFO stories in Nevada. There's sightings, landings, abductions, crash retrievals, the whole bit. And as you can see, Nevada has its own particular flavor of sightings. And some famous, some well-known, and some, I'm guessing, yeah, you haven't heard of before. And uh, that's why I wanted to do this video. Because after doing research on a number of different states, each state has a really powerful contribution to our understanding of the UFO phenomenon. And Nevada is right at the top of the list there with how we think about UFOs. So that's my presentation. Thanks once again for listening and keep having fun.